Thank you, Julian and Cornelia. Um, my name is Elizabeth Leek, and I am the director and founder of STEM Trek Nonprofit. I've come to talk to you today about my career path, and I like to describe myself as a feather in the wind. I think I, I'm where I'm right, where I'm supposed to be, but it wasn't always easy getting to where I am today. And here I am as a baby. Um, I, I can honestly say I was probably, in some regards, a disappointment. My parents had two wonderful daughters already, and my grandmother had knitted a blue baby blanket before I was born, hoping that maybe that would influence somehow the gender. And here I came out, this cute little girl. And of course, then they had three beautiful daughters. Uh, my brother came along six years later. So I was the son, the pseudo son for my father, who took me everywhere he went for many years until my brother was old enough to join him. But one of the things I, I try to convey to parents today, and, and I know with STEM engagement, we often talk to girls in high school, sometimes junior high, but we're, we need to talk to families and parents. And I'm especially grateful for male allies, but parents, and it depends on the culture, the region and, and the generation, but you know, labels are very bad. And with my sisters and myself, my one sister was very, very, very smart. And she was so smart that the high school counselor came to the home and told my parents, look, this girl needs to go to college because she scored better than all the boys on the admissions exams. So she went on to medical school and became a physician. My other sister and I, kind of went on a vocational track. I studied business and my other sister was, is a medical coder. And I think, I don't think we're any less intelligent than my sister that became the physician, but that largely I feel in my case was due to labels that were put on us, but that's not my parents' fault. That's a generational cultural thing, but labels are bad. Uh, and as I tell, when I speak to Pan-African groups, about women in STEM, I, and, and in some places that's a real a bizarre concept, in others they're way ahead of us, but uh, Africa's a big place. It, but women are 50% of our potential, so don't label girls early. So wanting to be the good daughter that I, I was and am, I married the week I turned 19. This is my daddy, and he meant well. He, he wanted me to marry well so that I would be taken care of and I wouldn't have to work. And that was, again, a very generational thing. So I was fortunate that my husband supported education and his work was in Urbana, Illinois. He was a banker and the University of Illinois is in Urbana. So I was lucky in that I could attend the University of Illinois. I enrolled and um, my son was born the first day of class my senior year. And I was studying graphic design because I was good in art and that was my decision tree. Oh, good in art, I must pursue design. So I did. And it was a very, very rigorous BFA program and a five-year degree program. So it was a great education and it prepared me in many ways for life and my career. But I like to think my, my son who went with me to class, uh, one professor, when I was in the back of the, a huge auditorium trying to eat my lunch and breastfeed in the dark where no one could see me. And the professor got up front and said, I saw this insane woman on a bicycle with an infant. And of course that was me and I was doing my best to hide, but he went everywhere with me and he is a designer today. So maybe that influenced his career track. My daughter was born a few years later as you can see, redheads run in the family. But by and large, my career path was very circuitous. I lacked mentors and guidance as far as education. I was first generation, dubiously college bound. 
I think if I had pursued my own interests, I, I would have been a biologist because I loved bugs and creatures and was usually barefoot running around the woods or the fields trying to find snakes and other critters. Um, and I still love biology and nature. But because I was good at art, I was encouraged to go to art school. I went to business management school uh, at a vocational college, junior college, because my father's business was, was not in good shape. The economy was tanking at the time. And I thought if I studied business, I could help him with his business. So that was how my decisions were made. Um, but I worked in public universities and I knew that um, having a job with a public university in Illinois would assure that my children could have 50% off of their tuition. And my tuition was covered 100%. So I spent 10 years in public affairs until one day um, I was a graphic designer and I managed the publications office and we always had, of course, everybody had computers and I enjoyed the technology installing new software. And I understood the uh, graphics image processors that were needed to um, manage the, the typesetting arm of the public affairs at that time. And one of the, a fellow soccer mom was a network engineer and she noted that the central IT department was never called to my division for repairs or installations. And she understood that I took care of all the graphics apps. And I confirmed that I do. And that's what I did nights and weekends, especially if somebody else went on vacation, I would work on their computer. So she suggested that I apply for a position with IT and I did, and I got the job. And I spent 11 years in central IT administration. And again, I started managing the computer labs and then I went to assistant and associate director. And I, I got a, a very good understanding of the, the breadth of roles within central IT from an enterprise standpoint. And in 2002, my um, chief information officer at the time said, I didn't realize you have a background in communications. I said, well, yeah, but I made a conscious effort to move away from that. Um, and also at the time, the, the public affairs, I'd gone to a conference in communications and the theme for one of the keynotes was the clericalization of the field. And I thought technology administration would be more lucrative. And I was facing the prospect of being a single parent. And I really wanted to make earn a better living so that I could support my children. So when the CEO or CIO came to me and said, we need a communicator, I said, no, 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 I left. I left that a long time ago. I want to, I want to administer technology. And he said, well, we have a position that will work closely with our chief network architect to build a high-speed network throughout the northern part of, of the state where I lived. And I said, oh, that sounds interesting. So part of that role was to write stories about technology and innovation that was enabled by high-speed networks and the relationships that could be formed between industry, academia, and national labs. And in that role, I worked really closely with Argonne National Laboratory near Chicago, Illinois. And I learned about how networks were developed from this, it was the starlight point of presence in, at Northwestern University in Chicago. And our college, our university was at DeKalb, Illinois. And how what was pushed along that network fed everything to the West beyond DeKalb. And that fascinated me. So we finished developing NIUNet and I was there for eight years. And then in 2008, um, there was an economic downturn again. And they made the decision to eliminate positions that were not mission critical technical positions. And by that time we needed more cybersecurity. So my position was low hanging fruit because by then I was more communications and public affairs decided to take over the IT communications. So I looked to Argonne National Laboratory and applied for a position 
to be the TerraGrid uh, Project External Relations Coordinator. And TerraGrid was the first, well, I guess it was the second iteration of the National Science Foundation's Federated Cyber Infrastructure that is funded by taxpayer dollars. And I served as its external relations coordinator between 2008 and 2011. <clears throat> and when TerraGrid ended in 11, um, in July, my mother passed away in August, but the year prior to her death, I was traveling a lot for TerraGrid and she required 24 seven constant care my siblings lived in the town where she lived. So when I was home on the weekends, I would come and give them some relief. And, um, and the, when she finally passed and my job ended, <clears throat> I was the one that had to help prepare her house to be sold because they had jobs. So I found myself fixing her foundation in the basement, which had just crumbled to sand in places. And that tedious meaning meaningless work. Um, it was very menial, you know, carrying buckets of bricks and sand from a basement and the basement had a low clearance. So it was, it was like the type of work I imagine you must be forced to do if you go to hell. <laughs> it was awful. And, but it gave me time to think. And um, while I was doing that, of course, for the months that, that followed, I was neglecting my job search and with the downturn of the economy, the gig culture had started. So a lot of the technical jobs had, had transitioned from the baseline funded salaried positions that I had come to know and love over nearly 20 years of working for state universities to where they were more transitioned quickly. And that was new to me. So I wasn't sure what to do with myself. Um, that's not me, that's clip art. <laughs> but when you look at the title on this image, it says plus size model looking depressed. And that was very much me. My children were grown and married. My parents were gone. My husband had left and he was remarried. I wanted to stay engaged with high performance computing and cyber infrastructure, but I didn't want to risk unemployment every five years. <clears throat> The hardware, by and large, and it's the same in Europe, there's a funding cycle that very much mirrors the lifespan of a warranty on a piece of hardware. So if you don't have the hardcore technical skills, there's a good chance you're going to be decommissioned every five years. And that frustrated me. And by then, the project I had been working for at NSF transitioned, and then University of Chicago lost the bid and they didn't need a communications specialist or external relations coordinator. So I took stock of my assets. I was broke. I didn't inherit very much money. My priorities for the funds that I did inherit, um, I fixed the roof on my garage and I bought a new bicycle. And time on the bicycle also spent a lot of, uh, I, I was able to think and exercise, which was good. But I had an abundance of intellectual curiosity, creativity, and, and resourcefulness. And my social capital was abundant. Um, as the external relations coordinator for TerraGrid, I was US agency and international liaison. So I gathered a lot of moss and I corresponded for at the time, most all of the global cyber infrastructure projects. I became a contributing editor to HPC Wire, Inside HPC, ISGTW, which was then Science Node. And uh, for a while I blogged for CERN's Gridcast. And I thought about what brought me joy. And of course my family brings me joy. I now have grandkids. But people, science, and technology bring me joy. And helping others, mentoring, training, uh, and enabling scholarly travel, broader engagement, breaking cultural barriers to build the RCD workforce. We'll never have enough tech workers. And when I say RCD, research, computing, and data, 
skills. And that's what everyone is looking for. But I found that people from regions that are underserved um, don't have access to hands-on access to the high performance computing or the resources they need to travel to conferences where a lot of the training is offered. So I formed STEM Trek nonprofit. And um, this photograph is of the first, one of the first cohorts that I helped facilitate with the EU US High Performance Computing Summer School. This one was in South Lake Tahoe, California, but the one the prior year was um, in Catania, Sicily. And if you dive into the narrative on the STEM Trek site, you'll read what was going on in my, my mind at the time, what I was concerned about. And the economic situation around the country was um, very poor and it, it was grim. And I worried that we would lose a lot of the, the potential, the human capital that we need to solve the global grand challenges. So I created a, a non-government organization, NGO. In the US, it's a 501.c.3 public charity. And I had I determined that we could help certain communities of practice, one being veterans. Um, veterans and my experience as an IT administrator, um, I, I had several veterans on the group that I led and they had all served in the same unit in the National Guard and they had left service with a light technical skill set, which was perfect. They were like a blank canvas for, for training in cybersecurity, network engineering, people with disabilities. Um, oftentimes people with disabilities don't get access to the technology they need to overcome or compensate for whatever it is uh, that, that labels them as disabled. The workforce that's displaced by automation, a lot of manufacturing workers are inherently engineers, but they've never had the advanced education needed to survive in, in the, the high performance computing world. Um, so light technical skills, again, certifications often help people transition that have been dis displaced by automation. Obviously people in resource constrained regions and in general HPC curious domain scientists and engineers and all demographics that are underrepresented in RCD academics and careers. And our logo is an infinity sign, you'll notice. And I want to pay tribute to my son, Evan, who um, his company is purebuttons.com and standoutstickers.com. But he's, as I mentioned, he's a designer and he designed the website and logo. And our organizational framework, uh, we're tax exempt. We don't pay taxes and donations are tax deductible. It's a virtual organization. There are no bricks or mortar. Nobody gets a salary. It's 100% volunteer effort, including my time and effort. Uh, so I usually work on STEM Trek nights and weekends. But a lot of times, people that I help are in different time zones. So it's not uncommon for me to get up at 2 in the morning and help someone. We keep a 50,000 US, which is 46,000 euros, cap on donations of, cur of currency. And that helps, it's, it's an easier tax process if we keep the cash donations capped because it's, again, I do this in my spare time and I don't have a lot of time or I don't have an accountant or a lawyer on the hook. We do have volunteer accountants and lawyers that help us. The house charges 20% and that pays for our post office box, web hosting, legal and software fees. And several times a year, and, and it's becoming more frequent, we have orphan requests from people that, especially during COVID, for example, one scholar uh, had to go to another country and quarantine for two weeks before her fellowship would accept her. So she had to pay for the COVID tests and then an extra two weeks of lodging and food, and that wasn't factored into the fellowship award. But by and large, if you tallied up the value, most of our donations are in kind. They're products or services. And I have a, a network of, it's more than 20,000 across four platforms that I source for mentors, volunteers, and donations. 
Um, conference coordinators will often give us registration waivers for STEM Trek delegates. And then our advisors are from US, EU, and Pan-African HPC centers. And we're looking for advisors and uh, officers now. If anyone is interested, please let me know. Uh, as far as international engagement, um, through TerraGrid, I started corresponding for the European Grid Infrastructure, EGEE, -E, EGI, and that was from 2008 to 12. That led to um, working with CERN on GridCast. I have visited CERN. Um, and the Partnership for Advanced Computing while I was working for TerraGrid and then through my um, work with HPC Wire, I actually uh, represented their editor once when she couldn't make it. And I've been, as I mentioned, I've been a contributing editor for HPC, for all of Taper Communications since 2008. The South African Center for High Performance Computing um, and Southern African Development Community HPC Forum Advisor, um, the, that role came in through tangentially. I had been working for all of these other projects for many years, and I was reading about the Square Kilometer Array being built in the Karoo region of, of South Africa. And I had never, I was so fascinated with the scope of that project and what it would do for the, the global scientific community. And a lot of the data best practices and high performance computing architecture is, was being driven by the needs for this massive project. So I wanted to correspond about it. And I wrote to the director of the Center for High Performance Computing, Happy Satola, and Usually, when you write a letter like that, and I, I being a not you know running a nonprofit, I have to constantly look for funding, and I'm very thick-skinned because I get I'm you know rejection. It happens all of the time, but I wrote to Happy, and I remember waking up the next morning, and he had responded favorably, and I've been going back every year since 2012. Again, I've, I've um, worked with International Data Week, um, the International Supercomputing Conference in Frankfurt, and in this photograph on the inset, you'll see Julian talking to me. Uh, he was asking me, what, why would anybody drink non-alcoholic beer? Because <laughs> there were green bottles and white bottles there. But um, one of the many convers wonderful conversations I've had with Julian, and in that photo as well, uh, is a student that was supported by ISC's travel grant. And Julian and I were advisors on the travel grant and the student program. Um, the SADAC HPC forum, and I'll talk a little bit more about the African project, but that was um, is separate and apart from SADAC in South Africa. That was just an invitation from one of their SADAC delegates to address the women in STEM group and um, I was very, very honored to, to be there and to see their data center in both 2017 and 19. I've been to the HPC knowledge meeting in Barcelona, um, the M3 HPC meetup in Ghaziabad, India. I've judged the ISC student cluster competition since 2019 and the inaugural winter classic in 2020. I've been an advisor for India CC in 20 and 20, 21 and 22. And the African um, HPC ecosystems project is led by Happy Satola's team, uh, the ACE lab at the South African Center for HPC in Cape Town. And that project started in 2012 with a donation from the Texas Advanced Computing Center that decommissioned the National Science Foundation funded Ranger system. And it was shipped to South Africa and South Africa broke it into smaller standalone clusters, put new switches and wire on them and installed them in several places throughout the Southern African development community region. SADC is 17 member states. And on this map, you don't see Seychelles or Mauritius or Comoros. Um, but you'll see the, the, the main part of the, the mainland um, where sites are established, plus Kenya and Ghana. 
Um, there's a newer site in Malawi, I believe the trainer Brian Johnston told me is, is doing really well. So that's how this is growing through decommissioned hardware. Another system was donated by the University of Cambridge and a third um, by South Africa. So what I found in working with these groups is they share a lot in common with some of the systems administrators that I've worked with in EPSCOR regions of the US because they come from very agricultural regions and they're passionate about the same science drivers involved associated with food insecurity, climate change, drought, extreme weather, and the food, water, and energy nexus in general. And I also wanna note that the SADAC training model was put in place online long before COVID, which is wonderful and should have allowed them to continue, but access to the internet at home is lacking in many places. So I think they've, everybody has, has been delayed during COVID and I look forward when we can be back together again. And this from 2015, STEMTREK has hosted a co-located workshop with the Supercomputing Conference. And this is our cohort from 2017. Each year we have a theme. This year was cybersecurity. And in this photograph, there are a dozen countries represented and I think about as many states in the US. So um, very, the conference, the workshop is held the two days before the conference. So this group has an opportunity to coalesce as a cohort before they go into the big conference, which is, can be as many as 15,000 people. So then they're not lost when they get into the big pond. And a couple of here in the inset on the lower right is um, a photo of me with Barisa Mosasane from the University of Botswana on the left and Raksha Roy, who is co-founder of HPC Nepal on the right. And in the inset are photos of Umesh Updhyaya from um, Kathmandu, who is the, the other co-founder of HPC Nepal. In 2018, um, the International Data Week was hosted at um, University of Botswana in Gaborone. And we thought we'd have a co-located workshop at the Kama Rhino Sanctuary to focus on the use of drones to help mitigate the poaching problem. And we formed this wonderful team of experts from around the world who met monthly and we were trying to raise money, but we found that the barriers, not only the, the cost to facilitate an extra week of travel for scientists from around the world was prohibitive. Um, there were some problems getting drones um, cleared for use. And we ended up just allowing volunteers from the region to, to come and use our plan. We had uh, faculty from University of Botswana came out and, and spoke and they put their head around the problem and they came up with a much different solution than those of us who aren't there would, could have ever conceived. Um, I thought we would use drones to spot the poachers and the rangers would come and draw their guns and chase out the poachers. But what happened was they used drones and satellite imagery to map vegetation because rhinos follow the food. And they found that if they could dispatch the limited number of rangers for a very large park, if they could in more intelligently dispatch tourists directly to where the herds were going to be, they would in turn mitigate the poaching problem because poachers don't like an audience. So that was had a, had a successful outcome, even though it wasn't executed as we had intended it to be. This is a women in STEM group from Iswatini, which was Swaziland when I first started visiting, but um, the king changed the name. And this was a women in STEM group, and I thought university age, but their level, but these were mostly K-12 educators, which was delightful. And that's me. 
And they've also built a new data, well, both a data center and a biomedical research lab. And um, they're very interested in training youths uh, in coding skills. Two projects I hope to investigate there are working with the Ministry of Health to improve data stewardship for rural public health data, and then tech training for adolescents after school. And when I was working on the interim gigs while I was forming the nonprofit, I had to take a lot of these gigs that I described in short term. I think the longest was three years. But in doing so, I was able to increase my social capital in new directions with each new position. And in January, I accepted um, the position of Director of Research Computing at Boise State University. And when I saw the position description, the person who shared it with me and, and asked me to share it with my big network, I said, gosh, I wish I were qualified, I would apply. And he said, well, I wish you would apply. And I did, and I got the job. So this is where I've been, Iowa City, which is in the heartland. And Iowa City, if, if you go out in the country, looks like this, a lot of, a lot of corn or maize. Um, many, many miles. Houses are usually one mile apart, as it is in much of the Midwest U.S. And this is Boise. Boise is, is 2,372.6 kilometers west, and it looks like this. So I'm really looking forward. I'll be moving in July. I've been working remotely. I look forward to learning more about that beautiful landscape and the wildlife, uh, the national parks in the area. And I have a fat, phenomenal team that I inherited that are, are wonderful. And it's, it's the most enjoyable position I think I've ever had in my, in my career. And I'm very grateful and glad I had the guts to apply for a job I didn't think I was qualified for. And I would, wanted to close with what um, inspires me to continue helping people who lack resources. And that, that is my family. These are my my children, you may remember from the earlier picture of my son and daughter, and they've had babies. And I'm hoping that we can all work together to make the world a better place for all babies and, and families that, that don't have the same resources that we enjoy. And um, hopefully I'll be able to enlist them in to helping me with STEM Trek in the future. So thank you very much. And if you have questions, please don't hesitate to reach out at info at stemtrek.org. Thank you.